Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the math class again. Thanks for the artwork provided, as you can see here, by Canlin Designs. If you are interested, you can go to the Magpie Diaries and support the poor artist. So today we're going to talk about Gauss theorem. As you can see from the figures, it is relatively simple. It's about the flux. That is given a vector field, and you can calculate its uh, outflow flux uh, through the closed surface. Surprisingly, this outflow flux can actually be written as a volume integral uh, over the divergence. And if you have been followed uh, our previous lectures, uh, you should already know the harder versions uh, of what we are going to talk about today. So, in addition to the mathematical skills today, we're also going to show you that how you can apply the Gauss theorems uh, to physics problems. In particular, if we have time, I may explain a little bit that how you can actually bring calculus uh, to a wonderland that you never know before. Okay, so let's kick off our class today. By the way, by the way, during the class, uh, I may or may not take some break, depends on whether I remember this or not. But try to remember, we have judgment, which means that if you have any spontaneous questions, uh, please just uh, type it down and I will try to answer them during the class. If not, later on you can also leave your message, uh, I mean basically associate with the video, and I will try to respond to them as well. Okay. Great. Okay, okay. I hope that you still remember that how we define the divergence. So in Cartesian coordinate, a divergence of a vector field is relatively simple. It contains uh, the sum of three terms. Basically, it's an inner product of the del operator and the vector fields. And once you calculate this, then that's what we call the divergence of the field. And let me emphasize one more time. So, Going from a vector field V with three components, Vx, Vy, and Vz, once you take an inner product with the del operator, you get a divergence. Divergence of the vector field is a scalar field, even though you might see like lots of vector notations flowing around. It is a scalar field. So today we are going to show you how the Gauss theorem, also known as Divergent Theorem, relate two different aspects of how to calculate flux together. So suppose now you have some vector field, let's call it J, and you have a closed surface like this. You can cut the closed surface into just many, many little segments of vector surface. You can perform the vector product out of that and sum it up. So that would give you the flux. On the other hand, you can also calculate the divergence with the scalar and then doing the volume integral. And it turns out that these two computations are identically the same. So how can this happen? Well, it turns out this is again the very beautiful, what we call the bulk boundary correspondence uh, in calculus. Uh, and previously you might learn this in uh, just a one-dimensional real axis, or here we are applying to the closed surface and also the volume inside the closed surface. Okay, so let's begin. So not surprisingly, you might know, in order to proceed, we are going to call out our good old friend, yes. That's uh, Mr. Cube. 
Why is that so? Well, because all closed surfaces and all volumes can be stacked up piece by piece, uh, cube by cube. And so once we know how to handle this uh, for Mr. Cube, we sort of get the major calculation and then you know how to really stack them up and then prove the theorem. So let's just start from the cube again. So for Mr. Cube, it has uh, six sides. And thus, uh, there are six ways that you can throw out of this volume. So, so we're going to calculate the flux uh, pair by pair, by three pairs uh, of surfaces. And so the, the one that I highlighted in green, that's the surface or that's the flux through the x-axis. And there are also flux through the y-axis and also the flux through the z-axis. So you can see for this surface integral, it can decompose into three different terms. And that's just a look at the first term first. Well, the first term, as you can see from the figure here, let's calculate this and calculate this, okay? For this position, x plus dx, uh, the vector field take on this value and multiply by dy dz. That's the flow out of the surface here. And for the opposite surface uh, located at x, located at x, so that's jx and also dy dz. But be really careful, when we have a closed surface, we use our right hand and then define the outward position as the surface directions. And thus, in this case, for this particular one, the surface is pointing in the opposite direction. And that's why that you have a minus sign here. Okay? So to zero's order, of course, then these are just a really minuscule change. And so then, if you just sum this up, it's almost zero. But we have learned partial differentiation, so we know that the difference between these two, although infinitesimal, is not zero. So what is it? It's just taking the partial derivative of jx with respect to x times dx. And you start to see the magic. We start from the surface integral of dy dz. But after you calculate the flux of the pair of the surfaces, then you get something interesting. You get a partial derivative of the original vector field times the volume. So that's the flux along the x directions. Similarly, similarly, one can just compute the fluxes along the y and the z axis. For flux along the y axis, you repeat exactly the same calculation. You got a partial derivative of jy with respect to y. For the z direction, you got partial derivative of jz with respect to z. And all of them follow basically the same modifications of dx, dy, and dz, and thus give you the volume element. So now, after performing all the calculations, uh, you got flux uh, through the three independent directions. You add these all up, then this gives you the total flux uh, outside the Mr. Cube. Okay? So once you add it all up, once you add it all up, then you got this term, this term, and this term. So once you add it all up, then you realize that this is nothing but just a divergent j. And dx, dy, dz is just dv or d tau. That's the volume element. And so you realize a very interesting thing. So that for calculating the flux through a closed surface, you can either calculate it from the surfaces, or you can calculate the divergence and then calculate the volume integrals associated with that. So then, by now, 
because we have a core element the Q, and then we have shown that the frog through the curved surfaces can also be calculated as the volume integral of the divergence. And you might think, oh, this is a special case. Well, but if you know the calculus well, the spirit uh, in calculus is that if something works uh, for Mr. Cubes, you just stack the Mr. Cubes uh, into arbitrary volumes uh, with arbitrary closed surface that you desire, and the result will stand the same. And thus, if you have an arbitrary volume, you can always decompose it into a collection of many Mr. Cubes. And since uh, this divergent theorem works for each Mr. Cubes, that is the infinitesimal element, uh, and you add it all up, it still works. Okay, so that is that completes uh, our explanation and proof about the Gauss theorems. Rather simple, right? Because you learned the harder version before with the scaling factors uh, in curved linear coordinates. Okay. So let's move on to really see how this applies. Uh, so let's uh, look at the first examples. Suppose now I take a vector field J. The J has uh, three components. Uh, and it's really, really simple. It's just uh, the x component is x, the y component is y, the z component is z. How simple is that? Okay. So, and then choose our closed surface uh, as the surfaces of a cylinder, as shown here. So the cylinder of radius A of height H, and then let's try to check whether the Gauss theorem works or not. Okay. First of all, Let's start with the surface integral first. So for the surface integrals, uh, now the flux uh, can be separated into the flux through the top, the flux through the bottom, and the flux uh, through the side surface. Three parts. Okay, so let's calculate the top one first. For the flux through the top ones, that is really just Jz at z equal to h, right, at this height, times the area, the area is pi a squared, and the jz at z equal to h is just h. So it's very simple, it's pi a squared times h, yes. So the frog through the top is done. The frog through the bottom, what can be calculated similarly, that is the oops, that is the jz component at z equals 0 times the area pi a squared. But be careful, for the closed surface here, this vector surface always points outward. Okay, so that means that the surface is pointing downwards, which then give you minus a component, a, a minus sign here. Okay, but luckily, the jz, z equals 0, the jz, z equals 0, is just 0. So if you make a minus sign mistake here, it won't show for these questions. And so the second part, the second integral, that is 0. What about the third one? Well, the third one contains a flux through a curved uh, surface because the normal changes. But remember one important thing for a cylinder, it's normal, has zero z component, and it's go as x divided by a and y divided by a, okay? And so then if you calculate how j dot n, the inner product of j and n, then that's jx dot nx, jy dot ny, okay? And jz dot z, which is zero. So I didn't write it down and jx is x, jy is y, so then you end up with uh, 1 over a times x squared minus y squared. But on the cylindrical surface, x squared plus y squared is just a squared. So that's a, okay? So try to remember the most complicated factor that you will encounter in the following current in, in the following surface integral 
is j dot n. But we calculate it, it turns out it's relatively simple. It's just a constant a. And so then the flux through the side is j dot n times the area. The area is the circumference uh, 2 pi a times the height h. And so that's the surface area, 2 pi a h. And this is a. So then you got 2 pi a squared times h. OK, so now you can collect all three terms together. And so then you come to the conclusion, the flux through the closed surface uh, is just the sum of the three contributions uh, that equal to 3 times pi a square h. And let's see whether we can calculate this uh, through divergence or not. Well, OK. So now let's just do an equivalent calculation by computing the divergence first. The divergence of j, according to the definition, is like this. And since j, x, j, y, j, z are just x, y, z, so its divergence is simple. It's just 1, 1, 1. So you add it all up, that's 3. Wow, how simple is that? So it's just 3. And 3 inside the volume integral. You can just pull out the 3. So it's 3 times the total volume. The total volume of a cylinder is pi a squared times h times 3. So that's 3 pi a squared h. And yes, you are right. You then realize that the way that you calculate it through the volume integral of the divergence uh, equal to the answer calculated by the flux through the curved surface. So they are the same. So this example here with the vector field and the chosen uh, curved surface and the volume inside is a very simple demonstration of Gauss theorems. It works and it's really nice. So it provides you a very convenient and powerful tool sometimes uh, that you can either choose uh, to compute the divergence and then calculating the volume integral to get the total flux or you can calculate the surface integrals and you will get exactly the same answer as well. So now that says, uh, let's apply Gauss theorems uh, to a very famous and very important uh, equations uh, in physics. Well, in fact, not just in physics, uh, in many branches uh, of natural sciences, uh, that's continuity equation. So I won't rush here. So let's uh, review the, the definition of the current density J first. So let's just uh, look at a while with cross-section area A, floating with the velocity V, and after time duration delta T, then these fluids will then occupy the area that is area times uh, V delta T. Okay, so let's uh, consider the situation here. If we have a current density J, then the total amount uh, flow through the area is just J times uh, A times delta T, because J is just the amount of flow through some particular areas uh, per unit area per unit time. So you multiply the delta T and A back then you get the total amount. And since we know from here that this j can also be written as just the volume times the rho, okay, that also gives you the total amount of that. By comparison, you then realize the current density can be written as the density times the flowing velocity, j equal to rho v, or in factor form, that just means uh, j equal to rho v. Okay, great. And just as I remark, if you intentionally choose a vector area a prompt here with a different n, and you can see from the figure that this a and this a prompt are not the same, will this cause any problem? Uh, not at all. 
because uh, if you really then compute the current, okay, that is the total amount per unit time passing through the area, and define it as j dot n times a, then that is j dot a. Then both, uh, no matter how you choose the cross-sectional area as a vector, this still works, okay. So that really depends on uh, how you're going to do this. Uh, if you don't really want to get involved with the vector form of the areas, uh, making sure you choose the perpendicular area, then all the calculation will be fine. And if you are a mathematical geek, you want to do something in more abstract and geometrically invariant form, well, okay, fine, just choose your favorite area and try to remember that the current is j dot a and then you should be fine as well. Once we realize this, uh, that's just uh, call our Mr. Cube to help us uh, to understand a very general form of continuity equation. So what is that? Well, first of all, the first question, we would like to calculate that how much amount is flowing out of the curved surface. And since we have done that many, many times, uh, let me just skip that basically the flux can be separated into the x, y, z direction, and the computed results are listed here. And thus, the total flux outside uh, can be written as divergent j times dx, dy, and dz. Okay, so that's it. And if you find this uh, confusing, go back to the previous uh, uh, film that we just explained uh, several minutes before, and you should be able to get this. Now, let's compute uh, how the charge inside the Mr. Cube changes with time. Okay. So the dq dt inside the Mr. Cube. Uh, so how does the charge change? Well, simple. That is how the charge density change times the volume element, right? But since the charge is conserved, this change has two courses. Okay. The first one is that you may have a source inside. And thus, uh, this provides a charge. And so then that is a source inside and times the volume element. And that will give you basically how the charge changes. And the second thing is the charge is flowing out. So you should just uh, subtract the outflow flux of the Mr. Cube. And combining these three terms together, then you got d rho dt minus s plus divergent j times dx y z equals zero. And since this works uh, for Mr. Cube at all locations, uh, you anticipate that you will get this uh, very beautiful differential equations, uh, which works uh, at any locations uh, in space, okay? So typically, we will then write divergent j plus d rho dt equal to s. So if uh, in case that there is no source is present, that means that s equal to 0, then this simplify to divergent j plus d rho dt equal to 0. Whenever you see something like divergent j plus d rho dt equal to 0, okay, that is what we call the continuity equation. That means uh, how the amount, how the charge changes uh, depends on how you flow out of the enclosed surface. That makes sense, right? Because nothing is created or annihilated. But in terms of source, uh, sometimes uh, the amount that you calculated, it may have a source, uh, external source. Uh, and so then try to remember you can generalize the continuity equation, including the source terms. So that's our full understanding of continuity equation. And the continuity equation uh, has a very interesting connection to conservation law. Okay, suppose now, suppose now, 
we assume that all charges are somehow confined in some local space. And I'm going to choose an infinitely large sphere to enclose all the charges that I am interested in. As uh, described here, so you have charge, 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 and moving so in some local space. And I'm choosing a, a really, really huge uh, sphere to enclose uh, everything together. And since uh, applying the continuity equation, the divergent j plus d rho dt equals 0, right? It works uh, at each point. And so, of course, we can integrate uh, on both sides. So that would tell us that the divergent, the, the volume integral of divergent j plus uh, the volume integral of d rho dt, they should also add up to zero. Okay, simple. But then we can apply the Gauss theorems to rewrite the divergent j the integrals. So applying the Gauss theorem, the divergence integral can thus be changed into a surface integral. But as I said, because I intentionally choose a infinitely large sphere, okay, at the very end of the edge of the universe or whatsoever, or even larger than the universe, because this is math. You don't really care about the cosmology the, and everything. So we know that this j vanishes uh, on the r goes to infinity sphere, right? Outside this huge sphere, uh, there is no j here because all charges are floating around uh, in some local area. And so in that sense that this j is zero and thus the surface integral is zero and this whole thing is zero, okay? In consequence, what does that mean? That just means that this volume integral of d rho dt should be zero. But what is this integral? This integral is nothing but, you can just integrate the rho first and then taking the derivative later, that is zero. But this integration is nothing but the total charge inside the infinite spheres. So what this means is that dq dt equal to zero. That is, this Q is a constant. And these are really something surprising. So if you really just look back the continuity equations, so you probably don't immediately see that something is conserved. Okay? But after just applying the Gauss theorems, you can show it corresponds uh, to the charge conservations. So sometimes when we deal with some new phenomena, uh, let's say in physics, in chemistry, or in evolution, and you find some continuity equation, the first thing that you would then ask yourself is that, what is the conserved quantities accordingly? Okay, and lots of interesting conservation laws has been found this way. Okay, okay. So I hope that so far you are learning all this. Uh, I hope that that's pretty much the mo most of the technical parts that I would like to go over today. And but later on, I'm going to give you some example about the point charge, and also I hope that I can also introduce a little bit more that how you can actually apply the, these techniques uh, on network. Okay, so if there's uh, any questions, uh, please uh, let me know. And it's pretty amazing that no matter how we, uh, yeah, even though that online uh, streaming is rather different than teaching in physical classrooms, but it seems that the person who would attend the lectures uh, remain the same. Okay, dokily. So let's move on.
that's uh, just uh, revisit our good old friend uh, in electromagnetism, Gauss laws. Suppose uh, now you have a point charge here, and you have an enclosed surface, not necessary spheres at this point, right? We have learned this Gauss theorem. Uh, what is QED uh, on page six? Uh, QED just means uh, that that's the concluding remark of that we have complete proof. Uh, And so, let's look at the solid angle. The solid angle is defined whenever you cut through a particular area, uh, then you find the perpendicular components of that area divided by the distance r squared. For instance, I'm taking a segment here, that's dA. But as you can see, with respect to r, is dA perpendicular is uh, contains a cosine theta projections, so it's smaller, and then divided by r squared. And so then, if you calculate this, you will get the solid, the corresponding solid angle. So simple. So solid angle, as you can see here, is basically the perpendicular area divided by a radius square, and then you get a dimensionless quantities. And of course, if you apply this to a sphere, then the total area is 4 pi a squared, and you divide it by a squared, then you got 4 pi. So the close surface uh, screen is off. Seriously, let me check. Hmm. Let's see. Oh, sorry. That just means that I got the wrong screen. Uh, the screen is still on. Hmm. Thank you for the reminder. Thank you for the reminder. Sorry that I didn't, uh, I forgot to switch it back. So let me elaborate on this a little bit more. Suppose now we place a cube and a surface uh, enclosed around that. Then you can actually calculate the solid angles. The solid angle is defined as the perpendicular area divided by 1 over r squared. As the demonstrating example here, you can see the blue dA after a cosine theta projection, then you get dA perpendicular. So this is dA perpendicular divided by r squared. That would be the d omega, the solid angle that it corresponding to. Okay. And a simple example, of course, is the sphere. If you got a sphere, its total area is 4 pi a squared divided by a squared, then you got 4 pi. So that is the solid angle for a whole sphere. And in fact, you can repeat the calculation as we will show you here. If you do that, you will find for all closed surfaces, if the reference point is inside the surface, uh, the corresponding solid angle always integrate to 4 pi, the universal values. So let's see how it works here. So the electric field provided what well, generated by a charge is this Q divided by 4 pi epsilon 0, 1 over R squared and R hat. And if you calculate the electric flux phi E, okay, then you know it's basically just the magnitude of the electric field. This tricky R hat dot N hat, right? Because electric field is a vector, the area is also a vector. And so then you got this one here. And a surface element dA. Okay. But since this R and N, uh, as you can see here, this E is in this direction, this N is in this direction. And so then they have a cosine theta angle between them. So this cosine theta. So writing it down, putting out the constant, this is 1 over R squared cosine theta dA, okay? But then this cosine theta dA is nothing but dA perpendicular. 
and this d a perpendicular divided by 1 over r squared is just d omega and you integrate all the solid angle but as I said uh, the solid angle for all curved surfaces is 4 pi so then you just got 4 pi this 4 pi cancel out and so then you get this uh, very beautiful form of the Gauss law or the it's basically the integral form of the first Maxwell equation about the electric field so we see that for the electric flux uh, through some closed surface uh, it's proportional to the charge enclosed uh, inside the surface Q okay and divided by one of echelon now which is just a universal constant so that's the first laws uh, that's the first uh, Maxwell equation so taking its integral form okay and here I would like to provide a little bit more of physics interpretations so inspired by the Gauss law that you found we, we found before the charges can actually be viewed as sources of things of the electric flux as you can see that it's a uh, emitting the electric flux or it was sucking the electric flux if uh, the charge is negative so again q can be written as a charge density integrate over volume and we already know that the electric flux equal to q divided by epsilon zero which can also be written this way applying the gauss theorem again this can be turned into divergence e d tau and integrate over the volumes and since this volume integral is arbitrary and thus divergence e minus rho divided by epsilon naught must vanishes everywhere and thus we get a more elegant differential forms of the electric field that is divergence e equal to rho divided by epsilon naught and so from now on once you learn all the techniques and tricks that how you can convert the surface integral to volume integral the volume integral to surface integral I do hope that whenever you see if you see some vector field and its divergence equal to some uh, scalar materials uh, that scalar field is the source is the source term of the vector field so in this sense uh, this Maxwell equation tells us uh, that the charge okay the charge is the source of the electric field this is as simple as that so that's pretty cute so basically when someone say the charges uh, can be viewed as sources or things of the electric flux phi e it is really based on a very solid mathematical differential equation that divergence E equals uh, rho divided by epsilon zero so by now with the Gauss theorems uh, you can find the differential form of the Maxwell equation you can also find the integral form of the Maxwell equation they are equivalent so learn both form well and then try to connect them so then you sort of know the electric fields are much better okay so in the following if you find that you are confident and you have handled all the material very well then congratulations it only took me about 14 minutes so great very efficient <clears throat> The teacher is uh, feeling well so without feedback so from the students so excellent from now on I'm trying to confuse you so if you don't want to be confused uh, you can free the live videos uh, and turn off your camera okay here we're going to apply this wonderful thing to the very simple source uh, that's a uh, point charge you have learned probably in high school right so let's try to compute the divergence of u of a point charge q at the origin how simple is that 
and the result can be surprising. Okay, the result is really confusing. So the electric field is a uh, Q divided by four pi epsilon naught one over R square in the R hat direction, or you can write it down as a constant and then R divided by X divided by R to the Q, Y divided by R to the Q, and Z divided by R to the Q. That is uh, relatively simple. And so computing the divergence uh, of the electric field is relatively straightforward. It's taking the partial derivatives of with respect to x and same thing to y, same thing to z. So what is the partial derivative of ex with respect to x? Well, take this term, right? Constant, just copy it here. You don't need to do anything with that. Taking this, you square the denominator, that gives you r to the 6. Taking partial derivative of the numerator times the denominator, okay, that is also simple, minus uh, the numerator times the, the derivatives of the denominator. And taking a partial derivative of r to the cube, uh, then give you 3 r squared. And then partial r, partial x uh, turns out to be x divided by r. So that is this one here. So then it, that's what you got. So you realize that this r and r can cancel and then there is a x squared term here. You can repeat the same calculations uh, with ey and taking partial derivative with respect to y. That would give you this term. And then taking partial derivatives uh, to z that will give you this term and you just add these three terms together and you get the divergence hmm is that really right so see you get two terms here you get two terms here you got two terms here and this annoying minus signs are uh, due to when you're taking the partial derivatives so if you just uh, pull out the uh, q to the 5 and then this r square and because here you got astral r so you can cancel it out that's why that you pull out the r to the 5 and so this term is just 3 x square and this is r square and this 3 y square and this r square and this 3 z square <coughs> sorry it you add this all up you got r square, r square, r square. So you got three r square. You got three x square, three y square, three z square. You add it all up. That's also three r square. So you got three r square minus three r square. That's identically zero. So after all this calculation of a point charge, what did you get for the divergence e? It is zero, zero. And this has a confusing consequence, right? If this is zero, then I can integrate over d tau. It is still zero, right? This is trivial. There is no theorem. Integrate zero is, uh, over anything is zero. And so you get a zero. But according to Gauss laws, according to Gauss laws, uh, this can be turned into a surface integral. So, so then you get this uh, surface integral with electric field would be zero. But this is wrong because uh, from the Gauss law, we know that this should be something like that. Or you can say it would corresponding to something like this. And so if this is zero, it would never equal to Q divided by epsilon naught. Then you run into this tautological inconsistency. That is, you have, you just, follow the step by step the definition of uh, divergence E you compute it and then you find the divergence is zero. <clears throat> this seems to make a perfect uh, final exam. So, so why don't I just stop my live streaming here and so then letting all of you uh, to figure out the answers uh, in the final. Yes. Okay. So bye. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. So what's the answer? The answer turns out to be deep.
and influential. That is, uh, it turns out the divergence E is not really zero. If you go back and calculate uh, everything, you find there is a denominator which might cause a potential divergence. Uh, and that's in fact the case. So in fact, our previous calculation tells us that divergence E is zero everywhere except at the origin. And if you then devise a more advanced mathematical skills and recalculate the divergence one more time, what you find is this. What you find is that divergence E is uh, Q divided by epsilon naught. And then follows uh, by a delta Dirac's delta function. So what is Dirac delta function? Dirac delta function is a very singular function that its value is zero everywhere except at the origin. But if you integrate over the functions, uh, you get a finite value one. So that's Dirac functions. Uh. Dirac cook up these functions uh, due to the need uh, in many, many different ways, uh, basically in when devising quantum mechanics. Uh. And mathematicians at the very beginning do not like the idea there is no such thing uh, called a function uh, where it's everywhere zero and a major zero point like the origin is divergent where it then give rise to a finite integral. And But at the end of the day, uh, some more courageous mathematician take on the concept of Dirac delta function, include them in the, in the definition of functions uh, and really, really rewrite uh, the related mathematical fields. Uh, so Dirac delta function not only being useful, it also extends, uh, yeah, it's basically just rewrite some part of the mathematics uh, in modern times. Uh. So if you are curious about more details about the delta function, you can find a relatively complete and detailed description in Riley's textbook. That said, let's come back to our confusion, then everything is quite reasonable. Think about that. Divergence E is nothing but charge density divided by rho is shown zero. But what is a point charge? A point charge, a point charge at the origin means uh, its corresponding charge density is zero everywhere. But at the origin is infinity because you have finite charges divided by infinitesimal volumes. But if you integrate the, the, the charge densities, then you get total charge Q, right? That's the definition. And so in fact, the very presence of point charge in physics forced the mathematician to rethink the very core ideas of functions in modern calculus. That's amazing, isn't it? So, this is some really interesting materials, I do hope, because it's relatively simple, so we are going to, not going to go through it uh, in the video today. So you will find this uh, monster's uh, functions uh, in the textbook, okay? So I hope that once you are careful enough and trying to sort all logical line together, and you might be the first one to find the Dirac functions, the Dirac delta functions. Amazing, isn't it? So finally, here is a more advanced mode uh, for Curious Cat. This is uh, not really within the scope of applied mathematics for freshmen. Remember that uh, the electric field can be written as the gradient of the electric potential and the electric potential uh, take the 1 over r forms. So you should have learned this in general physics, which I won't repeat. And once you want to calculate the divergence E, so that's a del that del that give you Laplace. So with this minus sign, keeping that in mind, and plug it into the form, and the constant you can put it out. So then for a point charge, for a point charge, the divergence E is just a delta function, right, divided by E. And so then sorting it out, that basically just means uh, the Laplacian of 1 over R. The Laplacian of 1 over R function will give you a Dirac delta function. 
this if you are really interested in how the vector operator works in three dimension this is really a very crucial test to see whether you truly understand this whole thing or not so you can go back and then convince yourself that why Laplace and Wonderful R eventually give you Dirac delta function. This is something really, really fun. And because of this, this is really, this has nothing to do with physics at all. It's, it's a property of the three dimensions. So, so in three dimensions, when you have a Dirac delta function, so its corresponding potential is 1 over R, so that taking the Laplace will eventually give you Dirac delta function. So. In fact, if you try to compute this in two dimensions, you get a different potential. In one dimension, it gives a different potential as well. And these potentials in 1D, 2D, 3D has been verified in various uh, condensed matter systems and has been verified uh, with lots of experimental evidences. So I hope that you sort of enjoy that if you learn all the technique, maybe this is really something that you can try your technical capability to prove whether you can see the left hand side in D is the right hand side. And both are challenging, right? Because here you need to calculate some Laplacian, here you really need to understand direct delta function. Okay, so that concludes the formal material I would like to cover today. Finally, as a bonus, I just want to show the Gauss law that you have learned here has the differential form and has the integral form and it's sort of connected to the flux through the closed surface and turn it into the volume integral of divergence. And what if the space-time no longer exists? In modern times, uh, ever since the emergence of network, lots of things, the social interaction is a network the power train connection is a network. Most of these uh, do not really have continuous partial derivatives. So does Gauss theorem applies? Well, if you are being more creative, then you may be able to find a way to implement what we have developed in this lecture, so our network. And here is, uh, I'm not going to go through the technical detail, but I just want to show you that there are some courageous scientists that are taking on the, the techniques that you learned in applied mathematics. How simple is that? And then publish uh, a pretty beautiful paper in scientific reports uh, in Nature Publishing. Uh, and so the, the, it's just uh, 2018, so basically just four years ago. This is relatively new and simple. And so how can you really just starting from the Gauss law that we learned here and then applying to network? Network, on a network, nodes and links, where you cannot take a continuous limit, where you cannot take total or partial differentiation. So what exactly do you mean by Gauss law? Okay, so for Curious Cat, you can look up the paper. The paper is uh, free, and so take this uh, journal information and download it, and you will find these materials uh, really, really fancy and interesting to know. And in fact, you can apply this Gauss law uh, to somewhere that you never anticipated. Okay, so that's uh, all I want to say today. I hope that. Let's go back to the very, very beginning. So that's the Gauss theorem. So, and I hope you know the fundamental and you, you know its uh, implication to point charge and thus uh, leading out the emergence of Dirac delta function. And hopefully for those curious cats, you will be fun to try to generalize this idea to network. I know that with uh, teaching on YouTube Live, most of you will lose the learning motivation. So. But no matter how many students, uh, maybe it's just a bunch of 30 students, uh, but here I still encourage you to spend some time uh, concentrating on polishing your mathematical skills and try to use your brain. 
it really helps. So I guess uh, that would be all I want to say uh, today. So thank you for attending the YouTube live today. Bye.